Hello, everybody. Welcome to the UFC 304 post show here on Mio on MMA. And uh, I'm obviously your host, Mio. And wow, that card. That card was a bit weird because, I mean, of course, you have the whole uh, fighters fighting at 5 a.m. <laughs> part of the deal here. And uh, let's just talk about the uh, general aspects of this card. The start time, of course, being very, very weird. The UFC putting this card on at American slash Canadian slash Brazilian <laughs> uh, prime time and making the fighters fight exceptionally at weird times. Might have given us some weird things. I know um, Cowan Logren looked really bizarre out there. And of course, Leon Edwards in the main event looked a bit weird. Now, you could say that's just their opponents making them look bad. But I don't know. I thought it looked a little weird. And this is not a fight is fixed thing because every fighter had to deal with the same issue. Bilal Muhammad had to fly across the Atlantic Ocean to the UK, had to still fight at a, had, had to probably have a really weird deal going on to, to prepare for this. Like if you're going to train your body's internal chemistry to be at its best for a 5 a.m. fight, then you're going to be awake when the, when the sun is down. You're going to be sleeping while the sun is up. There's going to be some weird things. So like, this is not me trying to take it away from Bilal Muhammad or I guess Jake Hadley. Just a point that like two fighters on this card did look, I would say, not uncharacteristically bad. Someone said this one. Uh, someone said this when I was uh, doing my uh, my Twitter like little play by play for the Lockrin fight. It's like no, it's just Lockrin. It's like mm, they both seemed their 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 flaws were magnified. Their flaws were more so than they usually are. So that that's that's my takeaway. So other than that, Mohammed Mokaev apparently is getting cut. That's the big thing talking. Well, not cut, but not resigned. And that's the big talk right now is like, is that the right thing? Is being a boring fighter in some people's eyes the most boring fighter? Although, to be honest, I think anyone who sees Mohammed Mokaev as the most boring fighter in the UFC, the most boring, just doesn't like grappling. Like that that's my honest takeaway. And it's a bit weird because I've had this rant before. I don't really understand why people who don't like grappling watch MMA as opposed to bare knuckle boxing, kickboxing, the little gloves, Muay Thai that, that one does, Muay Thai. Uh there's a Vietnam version of Muay Thai that I'm blanking on right now. San Shao, karate combat, boxing, you know, all, all of these things that don't involve the aspect of MMA that they don't like, but has the aspect of MMA that they do like is just a bit weird to me. But um, that is that. Anyways, he's apparently getting cut. Some people, or pardon me, let go. Some people are saying that this is just like a ploy by the UFC to like, you know, pay him less money or whatever. I think even that should be critiqued though. Like if you're going to be the, um, the big fight promotion, you know, we have the best fighters, etc 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 which has never honestly been true the ufc has always has had a, a lion share of the U best talent since the fall of pride but they've never had all of it but they will claim to have all of it and it's like is letting mokayev go even as like a a a, a, a a a negotiation ploy actually keeping in mind with that other than that what else do i have to say like just in general about this card we had the 1,000, uh, 100,000 bonuses, so the double bonuses were in effect, and Dana White is like, I'm never doing that again because the guys didn't fight hungrier. And I don't really understand that because I thought, realistically speaking, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are some dull fights on this card. There is the Lochran versus Hadley fight. There is Bilal Muhammad versus Leon Edwards to a certain degree. There was Shannon Bannon versus um, Elise uh, Ardeline. Looking on down here, what else was just kind of like not great? Arnold Allen Giga Chikatsi was like a little bit of a downgrade from what I expected it to be, but like I guess that's just me having too high of a high of um, you know hopes. But like we had a knockout in the co-main event, we had a submission in the third card of the third fight from the top. We had Rodriguez versus Christian Leroy Duncan, which I mean that went to decision, but that was a banger, violent fight. You had Nathaniel Wood versus Daniel Pineda. You had Bruno Brazil versus Molly McCann. You had. 
Bukowski versus Pragino, which was way better than I expected to be. You had to finish in the Patterson versus Crosby fight, the Parkin versus Bresky fight. So I don't, I don't really understand. I thought, like all things considered, the violence level of this card was probably, if anything, more than it should have been. So you're wrong, Dana. Not that Dana White is ever going to see this podcast, but <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to say, um, I think that's incorrect. Let's talk about the main event. Leon Edwards defending his belt against Bilal Muhammad. And we have a new champion, the first Palestinian UFC champion, Bilal. Remember the name Muhammad or Bully B Muhammad, whichever you want to call him at this point. Pretty simple fight to score, honestly. Uh, Bilal took rounds one, two, f- uh, one, two, and four on my card. Uh, there's an argument that he took round five as well because he controlled the fight for the lar- for uh, that round for the most part. I think like three plus minutes of top control time, if I'm not... Yeah, three minutes and 20 seconds of top control time, but the 44 seconds he spent on the bottom were the most violent of the fight where Edwards landed some elbows, busted him open, and if we are scoring this fight based on damage, that is a round that goes to Leon Edwards, in my opinion. Now, there was one weird scorecard here, and that was Derek Cleary's scorecard, who scored rounds one and three for Edwards. Obviously, round, round three, no problem. Round three was the round where Leon Edwards gets pushed up against the cage, gets i forget yeah he got taken down and then like immediately reversed it and ended up on Bilal's back and the frustration of course of that is that why could you not do that at any other time um it was weird but anyways the third round there's not much to talk about edward spent four plus minutes on top control there wasn't a lot of damage there wasn't a lot of striking it was just a it was it was a straight to control round almost uh, the same for round two and round four for Bilal. not much to talk about there but Derek Cleary went one round one and three, and I, I don't agree with that because while round three of the three rounds I gave Bilal was the most competitive, it was the closest in terms of striking, 17 significant strikes to 15 in favor of Bilal, 51 to 25 in total strikes in favor of Bilal, and Bilal had one minute and 45 seconds of top control, which was the lowest he had in any round of the fight except for the third round. It's a round that he won. I don't really understand how Edwards can win. Don't get me wrong, Edwards landed some good low kick or some good body kicks in that round and probably had some of his most effective at range moments. But the at range moments were like basically 50 50. And like, again, almost two minutes of the round was spent with Bilal out grappling him and controlling him. And there wasn't really a lot of damage. Again, like, yeah, there were a couple of good stinging kicks to the body and whatever. And I understand that, you know, the assumption is Edwards hits harder than Bilal because he has, you know, some level of finishes, but there was no indication that Blaw was significantly damaged by the body kicks. Like he just kept soldiering through, and maybe that's a complete no show. Uh, show not uh, not no show. The Benson Henderson no BS slickness coming through, but um, yeah, it's around the Blaw one, and he, like this entire fight was stunning. It's not that like it was a mesmerizing performance from Bilal Muhammad or anything. This was Bilal doing Bilal things. This was this was exactly the performance that he predicted and uh, and everyone expected him to try to do. Like in terms of the tactics and the strategics and, and everything. It's just Edwards at no point outside of the third round seemed to have a, um, a response to it. And the weird thing is that that third round and also the end of the fifth round indicates that he really should have actually had a response to it. So weird, stunning. Um, Bilal's not in for uh, an immediate rematch, which is fine. He had to wait a long time for this one. And the UFC doesn't seem to be in the business of an immediate rematch. And they shouldn't be. Because I'm I'm not sure after you lose your belt like this that um that there's any real demand for it. Uh, I get like some 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 Leon fans have like suggested that like, you know. You lose your belt, you get a you get a rematch. But like we know that that's not the uh, the standard. We know that like for example, uh, I was watching this with uh, Byron and um, and Devoid, and Byron made the comparison that this is a lot like the uh, Tim Sylvia Randy Couture fight. And yeah, I mean Tim Sylvia didn't get a rematch off that, and he was a longer reigning champion than 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 Leon Edwards. I mean that's that's probably your standard right there. So, hey, congratulations to Bilal Muhammad. I didn't think we'd see this day. I thought it was an incredibly safe pick to pick Leon Edwards. This uh, this was probably the fight I was the wrongest on. Maybe on the entire card. Uh, man, man, maybe Jake Hadley, Colin Loughran. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm at a loss to explain it. 
I mean, obviously, some people will point out the improved physique of Bilal Muhammad, the possible PEDs. Uh, you know what? I, I'm never really one to entertain such speculation because, frankly, I think the history of PEDs in MMA has been largely it backfiring, and that when we actually get contra, um, when we actually get confirmation of PEDs, it tends to be in losses more often than wins. So. And I, I just think that uh, almost everybody's using a little bit of something. So there you go. Hey, what are you going <laughs> to I, I don't know. Uh, next up, uh, Bilal Muhammad talked about Shavkar Rachmanov. That seems like the fight to make. And Leon Edwards. I don't know. He seemed a bit lost here. So, and it's always a bit weird when someone loses a belt and they're not like a fundamentally exciting fighter because they take, the, they take a step back and you don't want to mix them in with like the immediate contender crop. So like you don't, really want to put him in there with someone like a Jack Della Maddalena or a Shavkat Rachmanov or, and then of course you have like Usman in the mix there, but like, do we really need Usman Edwards for? You could do it, I guess, but I penciled in Ian Gary. It's not a great fight, but it's, I don't know. It's got some juice. It's got something. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. There's, there's a little bit of anti, um, there's a little bit of anti-Gary sentiment to take advantage of over in the UK, so eh, maybe that is the way to go. Anyways, oh, what was the bonuses on this uh, this card? Do, 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 bonuses. Uh, Tom Aspinall getting performance of the night, hundred grand, uh, two hundred grand bonus to Patty Pimblett for performance of the night. What, did he get like two of them? Why why did Patty get 200k? I understand. Anyways, and 100k to Mick Parkin for performance of the night. No fight of the night, which is a shame because I thought there were some candidates. Uh Rodriguez versus Duncan, as well as I can't believe I'm saying this. Bukowskis versus Prechnia. Actually, that's the fight I got wrong the most. Anyways, co-main event. Uh heavyweight intern title, and I I can't believe we're saying that interim title being defended because this is not how it's supposed to work. But anyways, uh, Tom Aspinall went out there. There was basically a car crash boxing moment. There was a little bit of a clinch. Aspinall went for a takedown, which you know might might not be a bad idea against Blades. We know he can be taken down. Nothing came of it. Blades manages to sting Aspinall with a nice punch and then gets dropped and pounded out. And that was the fight. <laughs> Um, Tom Aspinall doing a great job here, come back from a fight that he lost because of knee injury and, uh, getting the job done in, uh, what was this one? One minute. So these two guys have fought each other twice now for a total of less than 90 seconds. That is insane. Anyways, Aspinall defends the, um, the, frankly, let's be honest, the real belt. Screw you, Mr. Dana White, Mr. John Jones. He called out John Jones afterwards, nothing per- with the nothing personal, John, but I'm better than you, I, or I think I'm better than you. Very classy, very classy. It's not going to happen because John Jones is um, not interested in fighting anything that isn't like very low risk, very high reward. Or like, if not very low risk, because I, 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 Millie Jones is talking about um, fighting Alex Bahia, so that's not, that's not really low risk, but like that's, uh, that's exceptionally high reward and he's just not going to fight Aspinall. So there you go. Anyways, uh, although I, w- I I haven't seen anything from John Jones, but I I I imagine I really want to ask him about that whole idea that he thought Curtis Blades, based on their first fight, was way better and had all the solutions for Tom Aspinall in that fight that nine strikes were landed and Tom Zini blew out. I don't know. Aspinall versus Jones is the fight that should happen. We are more likely going to see him fight the winner of Gone versus Volkov. Or, hell, Alex Bahia could really throw a wrench in the system by wanting to fight Aspinall. I don't know. Curtis Blades, don't really have much for him. He's kind of, like, the problem with Blades, he's been at the top of the division for so long that he's fought almost everyone up there. And, like, I've got, like, the Spivak Tibera winner for him, and that is... It's a garbage fight, but I don't have anything better. Also, the problem with him is that you don't want him fighting, like, any up-and-comers... Because he represents a wrestling ta- uh, test that like isn't actually relevant to the rest of their career. <laughs> um, Bobby Green versus Patty Pimblett. I don't have much to say about this fight other than Bobby Green kind of screwed it up. King Green, I should say, kind of screwed this one up. 
Not much happened for the first two minutes. There was a couple of kicks going on. Both guys were throwing actually a lot of kicks. But uh, anyways, at the end of the day, Green ducks into a takedown after Patty is trying to go a little bit aggressive. Ends up right in a guillotine choke, transition to a triangle, and then to an arm bar. Bobby Green or King Green gets basically choked out well in an arm bar as well as a triangle choke. And Patty Pimblett has easily the biggest win of his career. The first time that he's really kind of proved me wrong. I guess. Although, I don't know. It's a weird thing because, like, realistically, this just feels like a fight that Bobby Green uh, brain farted away. Like, it really does feel like that. I, I, I don't re- and I don't want to take it away from Patty Pimblett. Like, he went out there and he did his part. Like, he, he did what he was supposed to do. He was given an opportunity to end the fight, and he did. He showed off very slick jiu-jitsu. Nice transition work. Beautiful. Mm. Probably the finest grappling of the night. Came from Patty Pimblett here. But man, I can't help but think that like if Bobby Green just doesn't try to take him down, <laughs> we might be talking about a very different fight. I don't, well, we definitely are talking about a very different fight. But like it, it's my whole basis of picking this fight was that Bobby Green would be smart enough not to grapple with him. And looking at Bobby Green's UFC stats, I guess I kind of should have seen this coming because um, here's the deal. I was I, I didn't I didn't think to look for this because I mean, why would you? Uh, for the record, he did outstrike him almost two to one uh, in terms of strikes landed between him and Pimblet. Pimblet, but uh, his only actual takedown shots are against guys like Jim Miller and Tiago Moises. <laughs> so, he, he, <laughs> you know, for a guy who's fought like you know very much striker only type guys like uh, Fazeev and um, Nazar Akbarast. Although I don't know, Akbarast is a pretty well rounded guy, but like you know, guys who are more known for their striking. Jalen Turner comes to mind as well. His actual only takedowns are against, of his UFC career are now against Patty Pimblett, uh, Jim Miller, Tiago Moises, uh, Adam Patrick, bizarrely, uh, Lando Venado. Okay, that's, that's that's the exception one, and then like Clay Guida, and then you're back to like Francisco Trinaldo, Dracar Close. It's kind of like it's kind of weird. He does take down guys that you would think ideally you would want to avoid actually grappling with because. That's how this should work. But I guess not. Um, some people have like been suggesting, you know, the fix is in or whatever. I, I'm not saying it. I, I am in no way saying the fix is in. I'm just saying that this fight was decided by Bobby Green's momentary failure of fight IQ. More so than anything that I think is like, more so than anyone had wrong in the matchup or right in the matchup. Patty Pimblett after the fight called out Moicano if he beats BSD. That does make a lot of sense. That's a fight that Moicano has asked for a couple of times. He even did the Moicano wants Patty. So, I mean, you know, obvious breakdown, obvious like fight to make, I guess. Otherwise, I mean, his fo- post fight was actually pretty good. Uh, it was it was confident, but it didn't come off as like overly cocky or disrespectful. And he, you know, even had the the tribute to the the young ba- uh, the young uh, the young Patty fan who uh, passed away. I can't argue with it. It was good. Uh, Pimblet versus Moicano is what I would think is the fight that you want to work to. And Green, I've got against a, in a rematch against Dober because I know it's incredibly lazy because these are two guys that you can put in there with almost anybody and it's going to be a reasonably fun fight. But um, I don't really have any ideas for him. Like, it, it just feels like that's the rematch. That's, that's a bit of an odd fight in both of their histories that we could run back. Would be fun. Fits the fact that they're both coming off losses. There you go. Lazy, but effective. Gregory Rodriguez versus Christian Leroy Duncan was, well, you know, Christian Christian Leroy Duncan being kind of exposed. Not in like a terrible way or anything, but round one was Duncan doing fairly good at avoiding the enclosed stuff with Rodriguez, but it was by like jumping away. And at no point was I like, this is going to be something he can keep up. And, and and he still won, and he still lost that round. Like that's another thing is that by trying to avoid that, he was like outstruck like twenty one to nine uh, over the course of the round, and even got taken down, held down for three minutes of that round. And then the second round, he starts more like clinching with with Rodriguez, which is something that he usually gets away with because he's so physically imposing in the clinch. But Rodriguez is similar size, similar height, uh, another athlete, a guy with a good clinch game, and he just brutalizes him with like you know. Elbows and shots, uh, gets a takedown, one for seven admittedly, but you know, gets a takedown, minute and a half of control time, whatever. 
And then in the third round, more of the same, where like they're just, you know, Duncan can no longer avoid the clinch. And that's kind of the problem I kind of thought with him is that he's a he's an all the way in or all the way out fighter. And historically, there's always a limitation to that when you don't have a middle game, because it means that you're going to express you're you're either going to have to have a really efficient footwork game to stay on the outside. Or you need to be able to bully guys in the clinch or you need to be able to like jump away. And like, that's not something that's going to last. Cause like, if you like, again, if you look at the first round, Duncan is avoiding pocket exchanges actually pretty well in terms of effect, but like, it's obviously taking a ton of energy. And then by the second and third round, he can't do that anymore. And he's just getting clubbed. So a weird fight because I mean, it was supposed to be Robert Brychek versus Christian Leroy Duncan. And then he gets Rodriguez on short notice. It's very weird. Rodriguez versus Ikram al is a fight I have suggested in the past. I would still like to see it. I'm back on that bus. CLD versus Eric Anders feels kind of appropriate. That's a Anders is a guy who has the physicality to test Christian Leroy Duncan, the raw size and the clinch game. And we'll see if he can like basically when asked the same questions, at a lower level and with less of a grappling threat. What can you do? That'd be interesting. So kind of a run it back with a lesser version of this matchup. Arnold Allen, Giga Chikatsi. I scored rounds two and three for Arnold Allen. Round one for Giga Chikatsi. I guess that's really all I have to say about it. The fight, the fight was pretty simple. Arnold Allen was on the front foot pressuring Giga Chikatsi pretty consistently. He was eating a pretty similar number of shots during that time period. Uh, realistically, if we consult UFC stats for what that is worth, uh, a pe- um, in the first round, Chikatsi outlanded him 15 to 13. In the second round, Allen outlanded him 16 to 13. And then the third round was very one sided, 32 to 11. But third, third, the third round was the break it round, like where Gig, I think, just kind of like had run out of energy and was unable to stay off the fence, basically. Like it was where it was that moment where Allen's game fully came into. Uh, its own. Now, Arnold Allen got the win here, and it was, you know, there were some cool moments. There was a jumping knee by Giga Chikatsi. There was a, there was a high kick in there as well. Like, th- there, there was some fun stuff, but it was very much just kind of felt like slowly Allen breaking Giga with pressure, and I, w- I would have liked to see more grappling. I would have liked to see a more MMA fight instead of Allen being 0 for 1 on takedowns, but it got the job done. What am I going to say about it? The only critique I have for Allen's performance here, I guess, is at the end of the second round, Allen's corner is like, we're up 2-0, but let's treat it like 1-1. I had it 1-1 for the record, but if anyone was up 2-0 at that point, it was actually Giga because the strikes landed were so similar through the first two rounds. Like Again, I have to emphasize this, plus 2 Giga in the first round, plus 3 Allen in the second round, you'd outlanded Giga by one strike. And most of the big like strikes, like I was talking about with the jumping knee, the high kick and everything, those were Gigas. So if anybody was up at that point, it was Giga. And, it, and one judge did have them up, up, uh, up, one, uh, up two rounds. Uh, if I pull up the judge's scorecards here, I can give you the actual name of said judge. The said judge was... Oh, no, no one did. I th- Why did I think this was a split? This was unanimous. Okay, yeah. And all, all three judges all three judges have the same card. They have my card. Giga first round, Allen second and third. There you go. Uh, anyways, and pretty much the entire uh, media sphere on that one as well. But, like, if anybody was up 20 to 19 at that, or 2018 at that point, it was Giga. Now, Allen came out there and dominated the third round, so I guess I can't complain about the result. But it does seem like that was a, I don't know, it feels like that was a fundamental misread of the fight. So that was about the only the only negative I had. Alan afterwards called out Yara Rodriguez. I didn't catch who the second name was. Probably because I'm just like, yeah, Yara Rodriguez. It makes a ton of sense. That's that's the next fight for him. Uh, Giga I've got against Dan Ige because Ige deserves something big. And Giga still has a name. Nathaniel Wood versus Daniel Pineda. So I scored all three rounds here for, oh no, I scored the third round for Pineda, ironically, of all things. Who who would have thought that Daniel Pineda, after getting his butt kicked for two rounds, would actually win the third? Uh, not that he got his butt kicked in the first round. I thought the first round was actually pretty, um, fairly equal, fairly equal. 
Wood was able to win most of the striking exchanges, and the only thing that was limiting him in the first round essentially was that he he willingly grappled on multiple occasions with Daniel Pineda. There was a, a, a moment that really showed this when Wood hit a front kick to the stomach that caused Pineda to just like melt, fall to the ground, and Pineda followed him to the ground. And that was probably a bad idea because if he had made him stand up at that point, I think he would have finished him. And then in the second round, no one, none of the judges, I think, scored this a 10 8. I thought it should be a 10 8. They scored Wood with having one knockdown. I thought that, personally, I would say that there were two. And he just beat, he just beat Pineda up in the second round. Like it was, it was, it was ugly. Oh no, one, okay, two judges did give 10 eights. Thank you, boys. Daryl Ransom, David Lethaby. There you go. Clemens Warner is the only one that didn't. All right. Where he outlanded him 47 to 24, almost doubling him up, dropping him, like I said, two times, multiple hurting him, busting up his eye very, very early in the fight. We were was clearly bugging Pineda throughout that second round. And then the third round, Pineda gets a takedown, ends up with three minutes and plus change on top of fairly aggressive play. Like Nothing that was going to end the fight, which I think he kind of needed at that point. So, you know, that's a bit of a problem. But, yeah, he he threatened a Kimura. He threatened it was some headlock stuff and whatever. Maybe a guillotine attempt. But, yeah, it just more or less kept him on top for like three plus minutes. And, you know, banked him around. A round three for Daniel Pineda. That's weird. But, um... You know, for a guy who's never won decision, he probably should have been looking for the finish. Uh, for Wood, I've got Edson Barboza. For Pineda, I've got Fernando Padilla. But, like, realistically, any kind of violent action fighter is fine against Daniel Pineda. Padilla is just the first name I saw. And then Bruno Brazil versus Molly McCann. I had Bruno Brazil winning all three rounds. I had a 10 8 first round where she brutalized Molly McCann's body. Oh, my Lord. Uh, there was a Rochambeau moment where. <laughs> Where Molly McCann did take a uh, take a shin right to the pills. Not the pills, the box, I guess, in this case. Yeah, this was a really, really good fight for Bruno Brazil. And I've got to give credit to like the, uh, the Fight Nerds camp. Because I've been pretty negative on the Fight Nerds camp up until this point. And I'm, I don't think I've come around on them or anything. But like realistically, they took Bruno Brazil here, who is a pretty physical, intense uh, fighter and so on. And... Um, They've added something to her because there was a lot more consideration in this game. And at least for the first round, a really good game plan. Beat up the body and largely avoid the clinch. But at the same time, she stopped doing that in the second and third round. She embraced the clinch a lot more, which allowed Molly Meatball to actually have success and survive. And she stopped beating up the body quite as much. I don't think I I actually don't legitimately recall her throwing much in the way of body shots. Does the UFC stats have that broken down, please? Yeah, here we go. Uh, shots to the body. Uh, round one, Bruno Brazil threw 17 strikes to the body, connecting on 15 of them. Round two, she threw five, connected on all five. And round three, connected on two of two. So, yeah, there you go. Kind of abandoned that game plan and also went with some takedowns, which, I mean, sure, got her three minutes in control, top uh, three and a half minutes of control in the third round, which, um, you know, won the round in my opinion. But it allowed it allowed Meatball to hang, hang around and get to the end here. I will now, for Meatball, I will say some nice things. Incredible heart and toughness. But that's about it. And kind of like I said when I was ironically picking her, but... Stating the fact that I don't think this move to 115 actually fixes much because I think Molly is just not that good. And this fight was a classic example of that where she had the heart, she had the toughness, she more or less had the right thoughts even. Like the game plan, the, the game plan was fine, but she just got, she just got beat up by Bruno Brazil. So there you go. Next opponents for Bruno Brazil, I've got Ariane Carnalosi, I've got Molly McCann versus Emily Ducote. And then I've kind of touched on this fight already. Cal Lockhart versus Jake Hadley was just not a very good fight. And I want to give credit to Jake Hadley. He took this fight on short notice, up a weight class, and looked comfortable, looked calm, looked fluid, and fought well. But Lockhart was just, just, just bad. Just bad. And there wasn't really much to talk about. Uh, it was just Hadley outboxing uh, Lockhart and um, being on the back foot and being pressured, but it just not really mattering. What was the final strike count? 81 to 66. Mm, they, 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 that's, that's closer than it should be. 
107 to 68 overall. Yeah, outlanded him in all three rounds, significant and in terms of overall strikes. And yeah, Logren just looked, uh, he looked incredibly stiff out there. He looked just out of it. And like I said, I don't know, maybe that comes from fighting that late that at that time period, you know, body chemistry being off or whatever. For Logren, I've got uh, Siri City. I've got Hadley going back down to 125 against Azat Maxim. Could Hadley stay up at 135? I don't think so. I think he looked really small here. And just the reason he won this fight is that Logren has a lot of technical gaps and deficiencies in his game. And also he fought just terribly. After the fight, the Logren was like talking about Peyton Talbot for some reason. I, I don't. My, my guy, Peyton Talbot, would wreck you right now. So maybe stay away from that. Interesting fight for all the wrong reasons. Mohamed Mokaev versus Manel Cap. They got into it at the hotel. Apparently, uh, Mokaev was like, let's take a picture for our Muslim brothers and then sucker punched Cop. So uh, not a good look. And his defense for it wasn't very good. He really he really denied none of it. <laughs> He's like, I'm not Alex Perez. You can't bully me. <laughs> what? I don't understand. Um I did score this fight for Cop. I scored the first and the third round for Cop. And frankly, the second round should have gone to Cop as well because there was one of the more egregious um, grabs of the, uh, the the shorts I've ever seen to the point of like ripping them. Round one was mostly a stand-up round where Mokaev was uh, Mokaev outlanded him, but I thought Cop landed the better shots. And then in round two, Mokaev was able to get a takedown for all of 12 seconds. And Cop screwed up his foot. So I still gave the round to Mokaev. On aggression, the fact that for the most part, Mo, uh, you know, Cop was very, very legitimately on his back foot. Like his front foot was screwed up. And that uh, that kept him from doing much. He managed to keep the fight going. And in the third round, it's um, Cop stuffing takedowns. And me begging Cop to do stuff. <laughs> like, just begging because for flyweight these numbers are, are these numbers are terrible mokaev landed uh 10 strikes in the third round uh, pardon me 27 strikes in the third round that was the highlight it was uh his his strike numbers were 10 10 27 and then 7 11 16 for cop that's terrible i gave the third round a cop still because of the elbows he landed from bottom they were the most damaging th- thing of the round and again damage is supposed to be king I don't object to the Mokaev scorecard, despite the fact that I do that I scored it for a cop, because I think you can easily give uh, two rounds to to Mokaev. I, I I don't I don't I don't have a problem with that. Um, now, what I do have a problem with was Anders Olsen giving uh, thirty twenty seven cop because he scored the th- or thirty twenty seven Mokaev. He gave the third round to Mokaev. I don't think there's a way to get around that. There's not much to talk about here with uh, next uh, next opponents because Mokaev apparently is not going to be here. So Ryzen, Cage Wars, I don't know. And then Cop versus Bruno Silva and hopefully a fight that makes him throw. Um, my final thoughts on the whole, whole uh, Mokaev situation is I don't like Mokaev. Like as a person or as a fighter, I find him boring and I find him a dickhead uh, in a lot of ways. But this is a sport. I know it's an entertainment. I know it's a there's an entertainment quantity to it. It's not a pure sport, but if this is supposed to be the home of the best fighters in the world, like it or not, Mokaev is one of those. And I can't help but this is just uh this is just a combination of Dana White not liking flyweight and not maybe wanting to deal with the difficulties, but like then then you know what? Say it. Make it Make it about moral character as opposed to saying that he's boring and we're not re-signing him. Oban Elliott versus Preston Parsons. Uh, Disappointing performance from Parsons. Good performance from Elliott. We'll see. I guess a time will kind of tell. Uh, Basically, the problem here was that Parsons was unable to out-wrestle Elliott. That That was the basis of my pick. That was what I thought was going to happen. I did not have Parsons going one for nine on takedowns. There you go. I did not have him getting out wrestled in the clinch as well. I did not have him getting outlanded in basically all three rounds. Uh, there's not really much compli- uh, complicated stuff to go on there. It's a good win for Oban Elliott. The question just is like, is this indicative of me and some other people, admittedly, being wrong about Oban Elliott that he does have the physicality to compete here, 
Or is this just, I don't know, a bit of a freak occurrence and a false dom? Uh, we'll find out. I've got Oban Elliott versus Jake Matthews. I've got Parsons against Munir Lazez. Mudashi Spikowskis versus Marcin Praccio was way better than I thought it was going to be. I thought this was going to be like a staring contest, basically. You had two guys whose ideal fights are where they can stand at range and kind of just throw maybe five strikes a minute and do their thing. But um, I guess when you have Marcin Praccio against a guy who's uh, taller than him, or not taller, but longer, he's going to come forward and kind of try to do the karate dash thing where he's dashing into the pocket with like the most awkward looking like punches in the world and landing short head kicks. So it was fun. It was sloppy. It, it was action packed. I, I want to say that this is probably easily the most strikes either of these guys has landed in a fight in their UFC run. Although apparently, apparently Bukowski has only landed 38 significant strikes. So uh, maybe, maybe not that. Because Bukowski, a lot of Bukowski's work came on the ground. He had two takedowns for like five minutes of top control. And uh, yeah. But yeah, total strikes landed by Prachnio, 120. <laughs> he threw 200. That's insane. But he got hurt multiple times. Multiple times getting stung. He did sting Bukowski's back. But like, it was clear that when Prachnio would land, it wasn't terribly traumatic for Bukowski's. When Bukowski's landed, it was terribly traumatic for Prachnio. And in the third round, Bukowski's gets cop control. Prachnio basically gives him I, I don't want to say he gave, gave up but like I think he knew he was down on the cards he knew he didn't have any answer for like the top game of, of Bukowskis and he just kind of made it pretty easy for the arm triangle to uh to be found so Bukowskis gets the win it's a big deal for him uh I've got him against Nick Nick, Nick and Mariano if Nick and Mariano is still around but he hasn't fought since 2022 it's weird as a plan b I'll put in Rodolfo Blato. For Pratino, I've got Ebo Aslan. I don't have much to say about Sam Patterson versus Kiefer Crosby other than I was wrong. But like a lot of my pick was like uh, Crosby just being an insanely large underdog <laughs> and me like all, honestly just kind of being offended by it. But uh, yeah, Crosby, uh, he got uncomfortable standing with uh, Patterson, clinched up with him. Patterson takes him down, goes to the uh, the submission work, which, you know, he is very good at it. He's a very good choke artist uh, in a good way. And he picked up an arm triangle submission in two minutes and 50 seconds of the fight. And Crosby's ground game is really, really bad. <clears throat> For next opponents, I've got Patterson versus Trey Waters. And I've got Crosby versus I do not care because this was the closest thing he was ever going to get to a fight that he could win. Mick Parkin versus Lucas Bresky. Parkin melted him. That's about it. <laughs> That's about it. The fight was actually more against Bresky than I thought it was going to be. Parkin versus Rodrigo uh, Nascimento. Bresky versus Dana White Contender Series fodder. What are you going to do? He's one and four in his uh, in his five fight run in the UFC. Like there's there's just there's nothing you can do with that really in terms of booking. Shauna Bannon versus Arlise uh, Alice uh, Ardeline. I don't have much to say about this fight other than I thought like I thought Bannon won all three rounds. I thought she landed. I'm pretty sure she landed more strikes in all three rounds. Let's see here. She's plus 20 according to Tapology or not Tapology, uh, UFC stats. Uh, 52 26, 47 28, 52 to 26 in total strikes in all three rounds for Bannon. Significant strikes. Ardeline did land more in the first and the second. I don't really agree with that. Essentially, Bannon was presented with more or less a punching bag in front of her and still didn't look all that impressive. Like, don't get me wrong, there is there is one part of Bannon's game which is actually pretty good. That is that her leg dexterity and balance are both very, very good. But there is nothing else. Her boxing is comically bad. She's not very physical. And when she ties up with people, she has significant problems. And the only reason she won this fight is that Ardeline is not good at anything. Ardeline is reasonably tough and reasonably physical, like has the reasonable, like the, the baseline building blocks to be an okay fighter, but that's it. She's otherwise just pretty bad. So 
Bannon got the win. I don't care what you do with either of them. I'm not saying cut them. I, I'm just saying I have no insight as to what to do with them. Like, prob realistically speaking, they're both in the position of like guarding the bottom of the division for people coming off contender series for different reasons. Bannon, because I just don't think she has the physical tools to compete at this level. And Ardeline, because she doesn't have the technical tools to compete at this level. And it'd be one thing if she was like super young or something, but she's 32. I don't think anything's going to get correct. I, and I still don't know why a 9-5 and five fighter off the, uh, the Romanian regional scene uh, got signed. I don't get it. I know she has like a little bit of like a social media following. I think she has like an OnlyFans or something. But like, guys, no. No, we did this with Paige Van Zandt and it didn't work. Let's not do it again. <laughs> like at least Paige Van Zandt was like young and athletic and with a good gym. This is insane. Um, anyways, that was my thoughts on UFC 304. I hope you enjoyed it. Check out the links down below for my social medias, my gaming stuff, and the MMA fighting simulator via the Discord. And I will see you for the next fight card.